Uh, I'm Gregory Pfeiffer. I'm the interim executive director uh, of the Institute of Current World Affairs, uh, which has been sending fellows uh, to Russia since the 1920s. Uh, and I'm also a journalist who writes about Russia. And uh, another very warm welcome uh, to our discussion about history and Putin's Russia. And uh, thanks also to the Pulitzer Center for co-sponsoring this event with us. Now, uh, it is just five days away from the 100th anniversary of the, the Bolshevik Revolution next Tuesday, November 7th. Actually, the 25th of October, uh, according to the Julian calendar that the uh, Russians used to use. But the Kremlin has been at pains to play down the anniversary of the, Re the Russian Revolution this month. Not only, I think, as a reminder to Russians of the power of the people, but also because that event highlights the contradictions in Putin's fashioning of a new national identity that draws on a schizophrenic pastiche of historical symbols lifted from all context. Perhaps that's par for the course in a country where paradox is one of the few constants and where, as they say, the future is certain, it's the past that's unpredictable. Hmm. Joining me to discuss the continuity in Russian politics and society is a stellar panel of Russia observers. Last week, there was a big investor conference in Moscow, which is supposed to be the way of sort of razzle-dazzling uh, Western investors and showing how attractive Russia is for a variety of reasons. The chairman of one of Russia's largest state banks showed up at that event dressed as Stalin. And his idea of kind of how to sort of lighten the mood was to have this kind of neo-Soviet theme and set of you know, Stalinist iconography uh, trotted out at every turn. Um, that to me is just it's something that, that kind of brings the bile up in my throat, um, given what you said at the beginning about how many people's lives were needlessly sacrificed after October 1917. Um, you drive around the grounds of the Kremlin, and there is now this completely out of place, oversized statue of Tsar Vladimir, which sits at one of the entrances to uh, the Kremlin, which is the place where sort of Putin or other leaders, when they zoom in and out in their motorcades, uh, enter and exit the Kremlin. It's completely out of proportion and out of sync with the sort of normal architectural uh, layout of, of that part of, of Moscow. Um, there is now throughout the sort of public and uh, internet-based discourse in Russia, a set of symbols that are being revived, whether it's the secret police in the 1930s where kids were dressing up at Moscow City Day not that long ago wearing the uniforms of the secret police from the 1930s. These are all you know, heavily politically freighted and, and to my mind rather, uh, rather unacceptable appropriations of, of a period in Russian history which needs more self-appraisal and more uh, self-criticism, not a kind of sense that, as you said, you know, mistakes were made, but it was all in furtherance of these great national goals. What Putin did, and it is a very uneven environment, and some places have roads and some do not. Um, as Andrew pointed out, and all of you pointed out, Russia is a big country, and also it does grandiosity. It does grandiosity like nobody else. If there is something that we do, we do on a big scale. That's why we like emperors, not just the czars. Uh, and so it seems that one of the orders that was given by the Kremlin, especially in recent years, is that whatever it is your little governors or little mayors do in your little places, you do. But you make sure that the roads are functioning, that people do not come to me, that your um, the railway system, and by the way, the railway system is actually really quite remarkable. Um, and uh, uh, most train stations are infinitely better than uh, airports <laughs> when you fly around in the United States. Uh, so that was the order, is that make sure that you fix general life problems, you know, the kindergartens would be there, maybe not for everybody, but we make sure that those little people that are there that are my subjects are not coming to me complaining because I'm dealing with big issues like hacking the United States elections. So these are very big issues for me. And I really think that that makes Putin, uh, continuously make Putin the leader that most Russians, not all Russians, not 95% as we are told, but 60%, around 60% would say, if not Putin, who else? So I was able to wander around, and in 56, 
Russia began to open up just a little bit. And that introduced what was called the thaw. And the reason for the thaw was that Nikita Khrushchev delivered a stunningly important speech before the 20th Party Congress. It was February 25th of 1956, in which he launched into a four-hour attack on Stalin. And that was astonishing to all of the people who listened. Because most of those people had their careers because of Stalin. They were creatures of Stalin. And I was astonished in December of that year to be at a National Day reception. Khrushchev was going to many of these. And to hear Khrushchev say for the first time since he attacked Stalin in February, in December, he said, when the history of Marxism-Leninism is written, the great contribution of, of Stalin. And he spoke about Stalin and mentioned his name twice in a brief toast. That was astonishing. And everybody understood that the experiment of the thaw uh, was essentially over.